Joe and I have been here at Crosspoint about 15 years, and um, just a year or so after we moved in to 44 Ranch, a young couple moved in across the street from us, and we introduced ourselves and invited them to church. And uh, lo and behold, a few weeks later, they did come. And they came when our church was meeting in the little chapel where our children meet now. And uh, they both got saved, got baptized, and we uh, discipled them. And uh, Adam and I became good friends. He came over and we'd work out together. And Amber took on the job of training our children early on uh, here at the church. And she's still teaching our children in children's church. Um, they have uh, become like our, our son and daughter. And we uh, love them. Their kids are like our grandkids. And um, there's a, a lot of men that I respect in this church and I'm really thankful for, but not any more than Adam. And he has uh, passed every test that uh, a man of God should pass. And so today, I've asked him to come and give the message, and he's uh, kind of my Timothy, and I appreciate what God's done in his life, and the message he has is so clear and comes from his heart. So would you give a good welcome to Adam Bellardi? Well, that was... Am I on? Yeah. That was an emotional introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, Pastor Bruce and I used to uh, work out quite a bit together. And, um, you know, I would always try and push him in racquetball or the weight room. And he'd always remind me, I am twice your age. <laughs> you can do this at my age. And I'd say, yeah, that's true. But he has also pushed me a lot in uh, growing in, in the faith and, and also in leadership. And so uh, I appreciate that and, and I appreciate our friendship. <clears throat> this week has been a very emotional and busy week in our house. Um, but every week is busy and emotional in our house because we have three teenage girls in high school and we have a daughter in college. So that's every week. Um, but, uh, you know, Monday, I um, got my sling off my shoulder. I had shoulder surgery a little over six weeks ago. And so uh, that was exciting. I had a very love and hate relationship with the sling. <laughs> but I say that because uh, if you do see me in the hallway, and, um, you know, guys are just a little different than women. Women will come up, they haven't seen each other for a while, and they give each other a big hug and cry. Guys just come up and want to punch you in the shoulder. How you doing? Good job. So if you could, just don't do that to my left side. I'd appreciate it. Um, Tuesday, I, had a, I turned a year older. That was uh, great, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, Friday was a big day um, for us. Uh, our daughter, Dakota, she is senior, and uh, she played in her final soccer game um, over in Bozeman, which was uh, very emotional in the sense that, you know, she had come back from her third knee surgery. And so um, she's just shown a lot of resilience and uh, perseverance and mental toughness. And then yesterday, we had an awesome testimony at men's breakfast from Jake Parker, a friend of mine. Jake and I have become good friends. Um, my wife Amber and I are discipling Jake and Alicia, and it's just awesome to see, uh, be a small part of um, seeing somebody else grow. And uh, so I would encourage you, if you're um, a, man in, a man in the church and you've never attended men's breakfast, uh, make that a priority. And bring your son or bring your nephew or bring a kid that you care about in your neighborhood. It's awesome when, you, when I see young kids at men's breakfast um, because there's great fellowship, but you're also going to hear good testimonies. Um, and now today I'm up here <laughs> and I'm usually down there. So uh, it's been... It's been quite a week. So Pastor Bruce, uh, a while back, had asked me to, to prepare a message. And I said, okay. And he goes, you can talk about whatever you want. I said, well, great. I'll talk about preparing the perfect tacos. <laughs> because I have a little bit of background in cooking. And um, 
we enjoy tacos. Plus, I think when we're in heaven, this will be like the manna of heaven. <laughs> we will be eating tacos all the time. Um, we have tacos probably once a week in our house. And I feel like you can turn anything into a taco, unless it's vegetarian. That's just called a taco salad. <laughs> but, um, you know, really, what I want to talk about is the truth about Christ on salvation. And uh, if you are eating tacos with somebody and they're not a believer, maybe you can use that. Um, no, today I want to share with you a message that's uh, close to my heart and to our home. God has opened, me, go, opened my eyes to something that's been really alarming. But it's also reminded me of how important truth is. And so I want to talk about, some, about a fundamental and foundational truth about Jesus that I hope he, nobody here misses. And I've titled this message, The Exclusivity of Christ. Are you in or are you out? I've had a lot of people ask me, what does that mean? Well, hopefully by the end of today, you'll, you'll be able to answer that. But I also want to warn you about a false teaching that's sweeping across the landscape of America and in our churches. So let's address the exclusivity of Christ. What does exclusivity mean? When we say that something is exclusive, we say that something is either in or something is out. Exclusive puts limits on a person or a group of people. If a reporter says they have an exclusive interview, that means they are the only one or the first one of the story. We see exclusive clubs that people can belong to. Down in um, Hamilton, Montana, there's a stock farm. And that's a very exclusive club. You not only have to have the financial means uh, to join there, but you have to have a status. Nobody from the public can go down to the stock farm and get a tea time or join their club right off the street. Most people understand that private clubs exclude or limit people from joining. These clubs have membership. That allows them access to the facilities and amenities. Nobody questions exclusive membership. All these clubs allow access for those that have a social and economic status. Opposite of this, though, Jesus says, you are in by faith in him. You are in by faith in him. Most people... They don't have a problem with Jesus as a person. Most people don't have a problem with Jesus' teaching. Most people believe Jesus is, was a loving person. I mean, how can you deny that he wasn't loving? He healed the sick, hung out with sinners, drunkards, and the lowliest, most disliked people in the culture, people from the IRS. <laughs> he, lived, he lifted up women in a culture that suppressed them, and he verbally attacked the most religious, self-righteous people of the day. As a leader of that time, he'd be considered a peaceful, radical, brilliant, moral teacher. Most rational people don't have issue with any of these things in Jesus' life or his ministry. So what do people have an issue with? What do people have a problem with? People have a problem with what Jesus claimed. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't just come to heal people and do some awesome miracles and then conquer death like some Houdini miracle medicine man. Jesus came to testify to the truth. That, that truth is found in the doctrine of the exclusivity of Christ. It is in this doctrine that divides people. So let's examine one of the most famous passages regarding this doctrine. For context, we're going to pick it up in John 14, verse 1 through 6. A little background, Jesus was meeting with the apostles in the Last Supper in the upper room. And he had just finished wash, washing the disciples' feet. And he explains to them that one of them will betray him. Then Judas gets up and leaves to betray him. And then Jesus gives a new commandment to love one another. Then he predicts Peter's denial. And Jesus is having a really intimate conversation meeting with the disciples. And he reveals a lot of truths in those chapters, especially this one. And at that moment, he has their attention. And in John 14, starting in verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. 
in the way you know. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the Gospel of John, Jesus makes seven I am statements. In John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. And in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And in John 10, he says, I'm the door of the sheep. Again, in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. In John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And finally, in John 15, he says, I am the true vine. Today, we're going to focus on John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus had made a claim earlier in his ministry to the Pharisees who were questioning who he was in John 8. Jesus is calling out the Jewish religious leaders in being descendants of Abraham. He tells them that they were not acting in accordance to Abraham's actions or faith. Even though they may have a lineage of Abraham, they were not acting as children of Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He was definitively declaring himself to be Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. And this was in reference to Exodus 3.14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus' claim that he is God enraged the Pharisees, and they took up stones and they tried to kill him, but he escaped unharmed. Jesus makes the exclusive claim that he is God. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So anything or anyone that contradicts what Jesus claimed is a lie. And that lie is called another gospel. In Galatians 1, 6 through 8, it says, I marvel that you are turning away too soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Folks, there is another gospel being preached within the church. There are many Christian churches and denominations that are prescribing to this progressive Christianity. And this is why God has laid this on my heart. Our oldest daughter, Ukiah, is uh, away at college. And when she, when she went to decide what college she wanted to go to, it was really important to her to find a Christian college, one that she could grow in her faith. She'd gone to public school her whole life. So she settled on a college that was Christian. But what she experienced in her first year is what I would call a faith crisis. Her professor in her Fundamentals of Christian Leadership class is clearly a progressive Christian. She was quickly challenged by an authoritative professor that Genesis is a poetic book. Everyone will be going to heaven no matter what they think about Jesus. The Bible is written by man, not the Holy Spirit. And other religions provide a path to heaven. And someday, as the professor told her in a private meeting, Hopefully, someday, she will have the intellect enough to leave her Christian foundational faith and believe in this progressive Christian religion. This really hit my daughter hard and caused her to question her faith. And I'll tell you the rest of the story toward the end here. So what is a progressive Christian? There's four characteristics I want to talk to you about today that define a progressive Christianity. The first one, they believe the Bible is fallible. They believe the Bible is flawed because it's written by man, not by the inspired word of God. As a progressive Christian, you can take what you want from the Bible and use it as you see fit. Genesis is figurative book, and Adam and Eve, they're not real people. The Bible is not to be taken literally, but figuratively. Progressive Christians do not believe there's a real way to interpret the Bible. 
The Bible is not without error. The second characteristic is they have a low view of Christ. What does that mean? Low view of Christ. Progressive Christians believe that Jesus isn't so much the divine Son of God, but rather he's a moral example for us. He's like a big brother that sets a pattern for us to walk in his footsteps. So Jesus is just a picture of what we can be and what we can do. And the main point of him is just an example for us. The third characteristic focuses on moralism, not salvation. They're big on this. The highest goal of the progressive Christian is that you just have to be a good person. And you should follow certain rules. And you should be kind to your neighbor. You're not really left with the gospel of salvation. You're left with a moral code. It really reduces it down to a sort of moralistic religion. The fourth characteristic is it downplays our fallenness. If you think you can be a good person, then you must have a very low view of sin. The idea that people are not really that bad or fallen. There's nothing really damaging us. We're all good people at the core. There's a downplaying of the word sin. And there's certainly no interest in talking about the wrath of God or judgment on sin. And God, he's not really upset with sin. So who's teaching this progressive Christianity? False teachers. False teachers are teaching this. These beliefs are completely contrary to the word of God. There's 27 books in the New Testament and 22 of them warn against false teaching such as this. Here are a couple examples that we see in scripture. In 2 Peter 2, 1 through 2, it says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. In Matthew 7, 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, all dressed up like Christians. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. In Matthew 24, 24, it says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And this is not in your outline, but in 1 John 4, verse 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So what, what did Jesus mean when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? What did he mean when he said, I am the way? He made the claim that he is the only way. He did not say, I am a way, as if there are many ways. This is a very exclusive claim. Jesus was dividing people into two groups. He's saying you're either coming my way or you're going the wrong way. In Matthew 7, verse 13 through 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Folks, everybody is on a path. Dr. Kevin Horton discussed this idea in a two-part sermon late July and in August, and he talked about these two paths that people are on. He said the first path is the, from the creator of the universe, and the second path is the path of the wisdom of men. Many people don't even realize if they're on a destructive path. The destructive path does not look destructive to us now, but it has eternal consequences. This is the world's wisdom that can be full of material goods, status, prestige, and power. However, this path leads away from the Jesus and the Creator, not toward him. Jesus says, my path leads toward me, both in this life and in eternity. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what did he mean when he said, I am the truth? Jesus made a claim that there is a truth, and he is it. He is not saying he knows the truth, and he's not saying my truth is true for me, but you can have your own truth. 
Jesus is claiming, I am the truth. He's making, again, a very exclusive claim. He's telling the world and anyone that has ears to hear that you can know the truth if you know me. Jesus is also saying, whatever is opposite of what I am and what I say is false. So that means there are things, ideas, religions, belief systems that are false. He absolutely makes clear what he means by saying, I am the truth when he's on trial with Pontius Pilate. And he explains why he's come into the world. In John 18, 37, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth hears my voice. I believe people right now are looking everywhere for truth, especially our children. The world has a lot to offer, and most of it is a distraction from the truth. We don't know what side of the aisle we should be on politically because there's corruption on both sides. We don't know who we might offend on a syrup bottle. We don't know if we get a, should get a vaccine or not. We don't know when life begins, even though we can see and hear a heartbeat. We don't know what gender we are, or we might just tell our kids they can choose when they, what gender they want to be. This woke, postmodern worldview has infiltrated the church. This movement is preaching and teaching that you can take some parts of the Bible and make it part of your truth. And other parts of the Bible you can discard as poetic or figurative or just up to your interpretation. No, Jesus made it clear that he is the truth and we can know the truth and the opposite of him are lies. Jesus' exclusive claims are either true or they are lies, but you cannot be selective with his claims. I think a better name for progressive Christians should be selective Christians. It's like, it's like selective hearing. Selective Christians get to play a sort of game and what we think we should pay attention to, and if it doesn't feel right, then we can just dismiss it. This is not biblical. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what did Jesus say when he said, I am the life? He's saying the opposite of him is death. The third comparison in our text is life versus death. Jesus was making a, a claim that he is life and that he is the way to eternal life. In Acts 4, verse 12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Progressive Christians do not believe in the atonement of the cross, but believe we ought to live a good moral life like Jesus did. Progressive Christians will always focus on the love of God, but they will not talk about a but they will not talk about sin in a biblical sense. And they will minimize sin compared to what Christ and Scripture say about it. Progressive or woke Christians will say things like, how could a loving God kill his own son? To minimize the cross, minimize the deity of Jesus and a need for a savior. How could a loving God say it's not okay to allow same-sex marriage or that homosexuality is not a sin? How could a loving God have a problem with changing my gender? as if God made a mistake. And somehow God is telling white people that they ought to apologize for being white. This new religion is saying we need to throw out the white Jesus we have in our heads. This new movement is about Jesus plus social justice. So what does woke mean anyway? Woke is a movement to raise awareness to social injustice and racism. If you're a true follower of Christ, then you understand that we're all created in the image of God, no matter gender, race, or economic status. And Jesus exemplifies this through his ministry. But reverse racism or talking about white privilege is not biblical. Gender identity is not biblical. He created them both male and female. So we need to wake up, not be woke. This is what's infiltrating our culture, our schools, and now the church. God does not see color, nor should we. If I had to guess, Jesus probably had the perfect skin tone that was neither white or black, but probably brown. I, and I don't know anybody that can verify it, but that's just my guess. 
So progressive, my daughter's saying, yeah. She's our, she's our brown baby. So progressive, well, Christians have to throw out parts of the Bible that don't fit their new religion and keep the parts that do fit it. So they focus, again, only on the love of God. The Bible makes it clear that God is love, but he also has other characteristics, such as righteousness, mercy, and grace. Righteousness, mercy, and grace can only be exercised if there's a moral standard that God gives us. We need a moral standard so we can understand right from wrong. We cannot have a civil society without boundaries, and we cannot raise our kids without boundaries. And yes, a loving God gives us boundaries. God is, for, is a forgiving God because we do wrong. So Jesus made a claim that he is life, which makes sense because he claimed I am, which means I am God the creator, which gives who is the giver of life. Jesus is telling us that he is the source of life and he is the word of life. In John 1, 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then the word became flesh. In John 1.14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 11.25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? When Jesus claimed that he is life, he made a twofold claim. He said he provides us a path to salvation or eternal life. And he also gives us the abundant life. Jesus provides us salvation through his atonement on the cross, which allows us to be forgiven of our sins. Since God is love and God is perfect and we are not perfect and we're not always loving because of our sinful nature, the only way we can be in the presence of a perfect loving God is to have a covering to offset our imperfect sinful flesh. And that is what the cross represents. Amen. It's only through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we can have such a sacrifice or covering of God's presence in heaven. Since Jesus was sinless and the only perfect person to walk the earth, it can only be through his sacrifice that restores us to the Father. His finished work on the cross gives us life, not death. I'm very thankful that uh, my daughter grew up in this church here at Cross Point. She heard sound doctrinal teaching. And yeah, her faith was shaken, and she had a lot of questions as she went through this faith crisis. But two things really got her through this. One is she had a foundation. And two, she had a body of believers. When I say she had a foundation, she knew things that she was hearing that were contrary to what she knew to be true. And I'm thankful that she recognized it and, was, and, and she questioned it. She could discern that there was some false teaching. It caused her to ask questions. It caused her to dive deeper into what she actually believes which I kept encouraging her, telling her, this is good for you. This is your faith. This is not your parents' faith. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Pharisees that had a lineage to Abraham, they had to have their own faith, just like our children. But she was not easily swayed by the false doctrine. But the other thing that got her through was this body of believers. She surrounded herself with godly people. She had a group of friends that helped her through this. And she reached out to her mother, myself, and Pastor Bruce. And we all encouraged her to give her lots of evidence of God's truth claims and evidence of this false teaching. Folks, we are not alone. And as believers, we need the body of Christ. We have an opportunity to have victory in this life, and it's through Jesus, it's through the word of life, and the local body of believers. Our faith calls us to encourage each other. Not everyone has this foundation. Not everyone is surrounded 
by believers to deal with a faith crisis. And my heart breaks for kids that go off to college and renounce their faith. The statistics are staggering for how often this happens. And now I've witnessed this and experienced this firsthand. Her and her group of friends of about 10 to 12 of them, for the first year she was there, would search out every Sunday and go to a church, try to find a church home. And it took them over a year to find a church that would preach sound doctrine. Eventually, they did find a church, thankfully, but dozens and dozens of churches they had to visit. So what did she do? She asked for help. She asked questions. And I want to end with a question that Jesus asked. In Luke 9, 18 through 20, it says, And it happened, as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? We talked about seven I am statements, but Jesus asked a very profound I am question. So they they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Folks, I believe today Jesus is asking all of us, who do you say that I am? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I I thank you for this church. I thank you for a pastor that is willing to to teach us sound doctrine and that is willing to stand for the truth. I thank you for the body of believers and that we do need each other and that we need encouragement. And it's okay to ask questions, to dive deeper. That does strengthen our faith. Lord, and I I pray here, if there's somebody here today that has heard this message and needs to make a decision, a profession of faith, I pray they do that today. Lord, I just thank you for our time together, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job, Adam. So one of the foundational truths of Crosspoint is just that. And if you're here today and you have never made a personal decision, that means that you have never come to the place in your life that you recognize that you are a sinner lost and going to hell and need salvation. And if you've never done that, invite Jesus Christ into your life. Religion will not save you. Religion will not get you to heaven. The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is Jesus because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So <clears throat> that is so important for us to understand. You'll never have conviction that that is true if you do not believe the Bible. We believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, every word of it. And so we can completely trust the scriptures. If you don't trust the Bible, then you have no ability to have a firm foundation to say, I believe that. And so Satan's first attack in anyone's life is always to try to shake your faith by putting a doubt in your mind about the word of God. And so I'm thankful for the message. And I pray that that is what you believe with all of your heart. And understand that we have a great battle today. The church is in a battle. And that's why this church believes we should confront evil as we see it. And and I want you to know it is not political what's going on in the world. It is evil what's going on in the world. And it is a responsibility of the pulpits in America to say something about what's going on in this country. That's why I'm encouraging you to buy the book, A Letter to the American Church. There's hopefully a few copies left for you to purchase today. And then there is another book by um, <clears throat> Charlie Kirk. And I don't know how many of you listen to him. He's excellent. He's got a podcast. He's one of the great voices today. But this book, if you have children or grandchildren and uh, they're going to be faced with a decision about going to college, 
You, you owe it to yourself to read this book. Nobody has been on more college campuses, spoken to more college students and professors than Charlie Kirk. That's his ministry. That's all he does. And, um, and so he wrote this book after realizing that colleges have changed. What they were doing in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, and that is challenging you to think. They're not doing that any longer. Now they are conforming you to think like a progressive liberal. That's their job, is to make a liberal out of you. And so today, you are doing a, your kids a great disservice to send them to a university that is teaching that and in, endorsing that. And so um, uh, arm yourself, uh, inform yourself, and make good decisions for your children, your grandchildren, and uh, you'll be thankful for that. There's too many of our kids that have gone to universities and ditched their faith because they did not have a foundation and did not have the association that Ukiah had at school. So um, today, um, we are asked to give testimony. And I uh, spoke about that last week, and I'm going to challenge you again next week. And I'm going to talk about overcoming faith what it means to be an overcomer and the victory that God has promised us if we will do certain things in Scripture. So I hope that you'll come back next week and we'll continue our study in 1 John. And uh, it is your job every Sunday when you come to church to look for somebody you don't know. It's easy, isn't it, to walk up to people you know, hey, what's happening, Dave, Jennifer, and, uh, and spend time with people you know. But uh, it is your mission and responsibility to go find somebody you don't know and introduce yourself. You say, oh, man, that is so hard. Just walk up to somebody and say, hey, hi, my name is Bruce. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, but that's what God wants. You know something? You know what people will remember that visit church? The message was great and the music was great. But I want you to know they're going to remember you not the message and the music. They're going to remember how they were received at church. So I hope that you'll do that as we are dismissed in a song and in prayer. So let's stand. I'll pray and then we'll sing and we'll be dismissed. And you'll have an opportunity to greet Adam in the back as he is uh, there in the lobby. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus. That is a name that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess one day that he is Lord. And I pray for people that are here today that may not have made that decision. I hope that they know that the reason that they came today was to hear that truth. That God loves them and that you want them to make a decision to be a Christian, to be a born again person who knows Jesus. So I pray that, Lord, you would give us a boldness this week, give us opportunities to talk to people and be a testimony of your love and grace. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Spear from Cross Point Church. I want to thank you for tuning in and watching one of our messages. We do hope that the teaching of the Word of God will impact your life and cause you to want to walk closer to the Lord Jesus. I hope that you will also consider supporting the Cross Point ministry so that we can do more for the cause of Christ. If you have questions about your spiritual walk, especially about how to invite Jesus into your life, I hope that you'll call us. God bless you.